he performs both open and endovascular procedures and also operates on tumors. Dr. Moko is happily married to Wendy Moko. The Mokos have three sons, Finn, Michael, and Connell. Thank you for your for being here, and you can share your screen, Dr. Moko. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a, from, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Oh, fantastic. It's a tremendous honor to be here. I really appreciate it. I wish I could be there physically um, in person, uh, as I've, I've uh, always had a fond spot for Seattle as a place. Um, I apologize if I have the occasional cough or sniffle. I'm a little bit under the weather today. Um, it's a real honor to be able to speak to you guys. Uh, I've had a tremendous respect for um, numerous of the, the people you name there. Um, it's a wonderful team. And uh, I hope today um, to share a little bit of my background and um, sort of a mindset and a way to approach uh, life and research and science um, in general. Uh, so I titled my talk, Be Curious, A Calling to Research. Um, so you might first think, well, you know, what the heck does that uh, hold on one second. That's there we go. Sorry, my disclosures. I don't want to skip those. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, there's a few companies that I am either an investor or consultant for, which I'll at the end I'll highlight a few of their technologies in the context of uh, new directions and things. And I'll certainly discuss some of the research from a number of these trials as well as uh, uh, current NIH and PCORI funding. Um, so again, I told you I, I titled this a calling to research, and you might wonder what what does that mean. Uh, it's an awfully strange uh, title. Uh, I often hearken back to one of my mentors, and another theme through this talk is going to be the importance of mentorship, and that's Nick Hopkins, uh, tremendous visionary in the field of cerebrovascular uh, neurosurgery and neurointervention. Uh, and Nick used to say, or does say, once they give you the mic, you can say whatever the heck you want. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to share with you some of the thoughts and lessons, things I've learned over the years in my career so far. Um, and so to do that, I want to kind of jump back to the beginning of, of my sort of scientific career. Uh, and again, back to mentorship. Um, uh, two people in particular paid critical roles in forming not just the kind of science I do or the fact that I'm a neurosurgeon and neurovascular surgeon, um, but also in the way I just approach every day uh, and really which gets to the heart of this talk. And those two people are Sander Connolly and Nick Hopkins. Um, both were tremendously outside of the box thinkers who were real visionaries about doing things. My experience started um, when I went to a journal club run by a guy by the name of Stefan Bayer, a really great uh, critical care, uh, neurocritical care physician, really helped uh, start that nascent field. Um, and we reviewed an article um, about the use of anoxaparin, Lovenox, in neurosurgical patients. It was published in the New England Journal. And in going over the article, you know, if you looked at it with a curious and critical eye, there were a bunch of critical things that were kind of missing. So people talked about it. I was just a medical student. And after it was over, I went up to Sander and I said, hey, you know, I could write something about this, write it to the New England Journal. And, um, and Sander's like, sure, go ahead and do that. Uh, and so I did. And actually, the first publication I ever had uh, in 1998 was in the New England Journal. And I thought, wow, that's really easy. Um, but it took me about 20 years uh, to get back into the 21 years to get back into the New England Journal. So it wasn't quite that easy. Um, but the reality is, is that both of those individuals approach life uh, with the idea that every day we're presented with an opportunity to learn, an opportunity to do something different and, and sort of change things. Um, I'm a fan of quotes, as you'll see through this talk, and Albert Einstein has a great thought that I uh, quote that I love. Creativity is seeing what others see, but thinking what no, no, no one else has thought. Um, as you walk through your day, remaining curious and not assuming that you know things will challenge you, but will provide tremendous opportunities. Uh, I'll also reference another great thinker of our day, Ted Lasso. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I've ever seen the show. Uh, sometimes it can be a bit crude, but there's some great parts to it. And he's in a, there's a scene where he's talking about people who didn't understand him or who bullied him. And he references Walt Whitman incorrectly. Actually, he never said this, but uh, where he, he saw a quote that said, be curious, not judgmental. And he says, he's talking about bullies in, in life. And he said, you know, they thought they had everything figured out. So they judged everything. 
But if they were curious, they would have asked questions. Uh, and that would have led to a completely different thing. And then the scene, which is quite a great scene, he then proceeds to whoop somebody in darts, which is which is fun. Uh, so that's where the sort of concept comes is I want us to keep open minds and I want to encourage you to keep an open mind as you engage in your own scientific career and learning. And that can be hard, particularly as a group of physicians um, or any caregiver, really, because often we're, we're, you know, we're proven to done, be smart people. We did well in school. Uh, we have extensive training. Uh, we're very hardworking. We're often the people with the most expertise in the room during a conversation about the disease states we're engaged in. Um, and so it's very easy to become judgmental. Uh, and we need to challenge ourselves in that capacity. Um, so, sorry, a message popped up for some reason. Uh, so the point being, there's always more to learn. Um, and so that's that's fundamental to how I try to approach every day. And again, it started with Sander at the New York Neurological Institute uh, at Columbia, um, where he sort of supported me in this way uh, to, to continue to grow and change. I, I started working with Sander doing uh, science, basic translational science. Um, right before I, I joined working with him, um, they had completed research. This, they actually did the studies in 1997. Uh, <clears throat> looking at a novel uh, SLX glycosylated complement inhibitory protein to improve stroke outcomes in mice. This was published in Science. It was a very uh, a big deal and really exciting study. At the time, there was something called the STAIR criteria. I think I've been there with Cameron over the years, uh, where they said, look, you really can't try to bring new stroke therapy. So many have failed. You really have to value that, evaluate them in non-human private models. So despite all this wonderfully positive mirroring work, um, the feeling was we needed to evaluate it in a different level. And so I got involved to work with them to do a microsurgical uh, stroke model in um, uh, non-human primates. A tremendous opportunity for me to learn in terms of surgical technique and other things. Um, and we performed this really fantastic study. And unfortunately, it did not work. Uh, at the benefit, there was no benefits demonstrated in the study. Um, so, but Sander wasn't daunted. And he said, well, let's first dig into what happened. Did the drug actually reduce complement? And we showed dramatic complement activation um, uh, reductions. Uh, and so we had to figure out what's going on. So we went through a whole series of experiments through murine knockout mice, uh, reaching out to random collaborators at UPenn and other places. Uh, but we ended up publishing a series of papers that really set my, my basic um, career going in translational science, looking at these things, which is extremely helpful. So I had this great background in sort of understanding, designing translational science experiments, animal model research. Um, but I, I really wanted to figure out and, and try to do some more. Um, and that resulted in a shift towards clinical research. At the time, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons had the Wilder Penfield, which was a clinical research grant. And, and in order to do that, I applied that I would get a, a master's in biostatistics to do clinical research and clinical trials. This is another great example of mentorship and the importance of having great mentors to support you. I had to commit to going to the, I got admitted to the uh, public health school to do the master's of biostatistics before I knew if I had the grant or not, but I was just a resident. And I didn't have the money to pay for it. Uh, and so I went to Sander and asked what I should do. Um, and again, as a mentor, he stepped in and offered to uh, make sure the department would support it if I didn't get the grant. Uh, and I got the grant and I was able to graduate. Um, and that really transformed my career. Uh, because it it opened up a whole new world to be curious about. It's hard to be curious if you don't have basic fundamental in understanding of a field or a direction, right? It's hard to wonder what's the the methodologic or epidemiologic uh, underpinnings of this clinical trial if you haven't studied about clinical trials and how they work. So from there, I shuffled up to to sunny Buffalo. It's known for its amazing natural wonders. It's uh, incredibly balmy weather uh, and it's outstanding health food. Um, and so it was a really fantastic experience for me. Um, and most importantly, it's a place where three really uh, transformative neurosurgeons were working and neurointerventionalists, doctors Hopkins, Levy, and Siddiqui. And they, they really changed my world in a degree. And so I want to take you a little bit through that because I want to show you how incrementally step-by-step 
staying curious will will ultimately influence and change your entire career. Um, and so I'll start with just having good friends and collaborating, right? Just working with people that you know to try to get to some answers. Not everything has to be <clears throat> the highest tier quality science. You can start with investigational work that can lead you in the right direction. So lesson number one is make sure you have some friends. Uh, medicine's a small field. It's it's a lot more fun with those friends uh, to see them at meetings and work with them. Uh, and then collaborate with those friends. Uh, work with them to figure out simple and straightforward things. Uh, but don't make it more than it is either. <clears throat> so at this time, this is very early in neurointervention, um, stents had just come on the scene for the treatment of aneurysms. And so we say, okay, great. This got FDA approved. It got FDA approved without significant clinical data. Or it had some clinical data, but not a lot. Um, how's it really performing? Is it safe? So essentially what we did is our our own post-market uh, clinical trial, which personally I think sh should be something that's generally used uh, substantially in a more formal way uh, in our device development world. Um, so we reach out to all of those friends and say, hey, let's collaborate, collect all, all of our data from our initial studies. So we did that. We had 10 centers. This is the device that we use, the enterprise stent. Um, it was very simple, very basic, descriptive, single arm. I really would emphasize to any of you the listening, if you're going to be out there publishing or, or working, um, don't make your study more than it is. Don't try to say, you know, this is a retrospective review of prospective and it's wonderful and try to kind of trick people. Just be straightforward. We went, we retrospectively pulled our data. This is what we have. Take it for what it's worth. I think in the end, you're going to end up in a much better place if you do that. But that allowed us to publish this paper and a series of others uh, that I think were very important. We we're the, one of the very first studies to, to document and publish on the potential high complication rate of using double antiplatelets with ruptured aneurysms. Um, and we ended up publishing early, midterm, and late results um, with really, really positive results. Um, it's collaborative observational research, right? The data quality is a little bit limited, but if you have a focus question, you can help figure something out. It's straightforward. You can get a lot of bang for your buck for the work you do. Uh, and it can lead to some papers, establish you as a foothold in clinical research. People see that you're publishing on uh, interesting things and they come to you for things that they're wondering about, see if you can help them publish. Uh, and it strengthens your friendships, which is a rich and rewarding part of the space. Now, the truth is with forethought for the same amount of work or maybe even less that you use to do a retrospective, right? A lot of times it's a, it's a great deal of work and it's difficult to dig into uh, retrospective data. You can do a prospective study that's even more efficacious. Um, so for instance, uh, a problem presents itself, right? And many people are familiar with this. Uh, the question is, is what aneurysms rupture? Which aneurysms do we treat? Which aneurysms do we not treat? And there was a lot of uh, excitement and consternation in 1998, New England Journal, when the International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms published their results, which had, whoa, whoa, whoa sorry about that, which showed uh, dramatically um, lower rupture rates than people expected. Now, this was retrospective. So here's a classic case of, you know, people making more of something than what it is. This was a retrospective review of data that was sent in. Uh, however, uh, just a few years later, they published the prospective cohort. And this is an incredibly powerful study that, uh, I, in my opinion, uh, anyone who wants to treat this disease needs to be familiar with. And again, while the rupture uh, predictive rates were much higher than what had been seen in the retrospective cohort, they were still a lot lower than what many people believed was the established natural history based on autopsy data. Uh, and in fact, this is a table that for any residents that are listening, if you're going to sit as a vascular um, uh, specialist at the boards uh, and you have me as an examiner, I'm certainly going to expect you to know, know these annual rupture uh, rates and risks. Um, but for an aneurysm less than seven millimeters, it says that if it's in the anterior circulation, there's a sense zero risk of rupture, which is obviously a bit surprising particularly when we have other natural history data um, from pretty large cohorts that suggest that it's potentially much higher. Um, and Bryce Weir, in response to these publications, published a really neat paper showing that uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysms pose a, a very large group. And in fact, 
Uh, of the ruptured aneurysm, 77% of them were less than 10 millimeters. So how do you say less than seven millimeters is zero risk? Uh, and in fact, 40% of ruptured aneurysms were in the anterior communicating or posterior or, or ACOM area, anterior cerebral artery area. But if you looked at unruptured aneurysms, they saw only 13%, right? So if you see a huge disproportionate representation in ruptured aneurysms, that suggests that there's a different natural history at play here compared to the other anterior circulation aneurysms. And around this time, a really neat paper came out of Harvard, uh, Bob Carter and Chris Ogilvie in their group looked at this really neat paper looking at the distribution and sizes of ruptured versus un unruptured aneurysms they treated. And what you're going to see is the unruptured aneurysms all are about the same size because they're incidentally discovered and they're choosing to treat them when they're reaching that six, seven, eight millimeter threshold. But the ruptured aneurysms present at different sizes. Proximal vessels on the proximal cerebrovascular tree are much larger aneurysms when they rupture. And more distal vessels, uh, pica, distal, acoms, they're smaller in size. So th this suggests that there may be some difference going on here. Uh, some locations seem to have higher ruptured aneurysms. So I thought this was really interesting. So did a bunch of my colleagues, some really fantastic people at, at uh uh, the Toshiba Stroke Research Institute uh, in Buffalo, New York, as I was a fellow. So we started, we did a retrospective review of patients with 3D volumetric imaging of aneurysms. And we did a multivariate logistic regression to look at potential reasons or predictors of rupture. And we came up with one uh, related to that Carter study that was a little different um, and was novel, and it was called size ratio. The size of the aneurysm versus the size of the parent vessel. And in fact, it turns out that was extremely predictive of the risk of rupture. So what I'm trying to say is you can imagine if you have a six millimeter aneurysm, less than seven millimeters on the anterior communicating artery, uh, and that would have a size ratio of four, but you could have a 10 millimeter aneurysm on a big internal carotid artery ophthalmic uh, segment uh, ICA, and the size ratio would only be two. And so this makes a lot of sense intuitively, but we don't know if it works on 2D angiography. We don't know if it works prospectively. This was retrospective. We don't know if it could be done in a blended fashion. So I told you prospective can be simple. All I did was train the techs on how to do measurements. Didn't explain to them why we were doing it. Put a one-page CRF for the techs to fill out for every single aneurysm that they imaged over a period of time. Um, and we then evaluated that blinded, blinded data. Uh, it was prospective. Uh, it was blinded, uh, and we only needed 40 patients based on our power analysis of the retrospective. So we did that. 40 consecutive patients, every single patient that came in, 24 were unruptured, 16 were ruptured. Uh, there were no difference in otherwise in the cohorts, but sure enough, size ratio and size in general was significant. But you can see the size ratio much more aggressively teased out that difference. And essentially, for every point increase in size ratio, an aneurysm has double the potential likelihood of presenting as ruptured. Remember, this isn't whether it's going to rupture, it's how it presented. And so therefore, we've got something that's easily calculated. It correlates with rupture status. And we ended this the paper with the sentence that's in every single paper. Further studies in a large prospective cohort should be done, right? Classic. Uh, everyone says this all the time, but then we tried. So I emailed the issue of leadership and I said, hey, what do you guys think? This would be really great. And I didn't hear from them. I sent them another email, sent them another email. Um, and I got back enthusiastic radio silence. I just, that, and and it's not a, a knock on them. I often miss many emails. I think uh, Matthias emailed me numerous times <laughs> to, to get me here. Uh, so it can be difficult when you're busy and you're later in your career. And this is where mentorship comes in at a big level. One day I'm in the Angio Suite and Nick Hopkins, my mentor, comes in. This is during my fellowship, asked me about how that stuff is going, about the aneurysms and sizes. And I say, it's going really great. Our data looks great. Our perspective data looks great. Uh, but I haven't really been able to get in touch with the issue of guys. And he's like, oh, okay. And he didn't say anything to me. But then I go out at the end of the day after finishing my cases and in my email box, I see this. You can tell this is really old school email. <laughs> in my email box, uh, he writes He writes to Dave P. Pekras, um, 
saying, hey, why have my guys been stonewalled? What's the reason you're not working with us? And so your mentor steps right in and gets your back. I didn't even know. He didn't even tell me he was doing it. Uh, Dave uh, sends this to Bob Brown, who's now running the, the program. I apologize for the misunderstanding. We definitely want to collaborate. Again, I'm really sorry. And next thing I know, I'm on the issue of writing group. And so I get to go out to, to the Mayo Clinic. I personally reviewed about a third of the angiograms there. Um, and we started working on applying and evaluating size ratio um, and other data uh, in the context of Ishua. It's been really tremendous. And then on top of it, something that's really satisfying when you start, when you're curious and you do science is when you see other people replicating your results. And this is a great paper out of the Sapporo study in Japan, where they showed that in small aneurysm, size ratio is highly predictive of rupture risk, uh, which I thought was pretty awesome. So the message here is mentorship makes all the difference. Having someone like Nick Hopkins who can hold the back of your bike and get you going uh, really, really is tremendously impactful and helpful. So I've got this now, now this experience, I've been collaborating with friends, I've done some series and some retrospective stuff, just started doing some prospective observational stuff. And I head down to Florida uh, uh, and start working with Brian Ho and their group, which was a really wonderful experience. And then we start. And now this is one, it's small, step-by-step. Step. First, I'm like, let's do a single center prospective study. We're just gonna, a new device is out. Let's just do it. We'll do it prospective. We'll be rigorous and we'll see where we, we get. So we do that. We publish the access trial. Then we say, okay, let's keep it single arm and keep it prospective. Let's go to multiple centers and collect the data. So we do that with really encouraging results as well. The America trial. So now I'm like, I got to learn how to do randomized trial, but I don't want to complicate it. I haven't done this across multiple centers yet. So let me just do a single center randomized trial. So is there a question out there I can figure out? And sure enough, there was. There was a new uh, femoral artery closure device called the Minx that claimed that it had less pain than other devices. So we did that. We did a, a prospective randomized double blind trial of the patient's uh, scoring of comfort with two different closure devices. We used fixed anesthetic reg reg regimens. I'll never forget. I remember one day I had this big strapping jacked guy that got the, the less painful device and we did deploy it. He never even said a peep. And we had a script we'd read and it was something like, uh, zero is no pain at all. 10 is the worst pain you could imagine, like your entire body's on fire. And the guy goes, um, and so I say, how how was the pain on that closure? Actually, it was a researcher's. I was deploying it. And the, and the guy goes, oh, it was about a nine, maybe an eight. And, I, and then there's this little woman, a yoga instructor, I remember, and aerobics. And she got the more painful supposed device. And when it got deployed, she was literally like... <clears throat> Like you could tell it was hurting her a lot. She had a tear coming out of her eye and we asked her how much was her pain. And she said, it's like a two or a three. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, this is never going to work. Cause you know, but that's why you do a randomized trial is so that you get to see what with the variance between people's responses, what it is. And sure enough, the trial was positive. It, it did show that, that there was substantially less pain with this device in the double blind study. So next question is, can you do that in multi-center? And so we did that. Uh, framing 18 coils in cerebral aneurysms. Uh, I certainly took a lot of knowledge that I learned from Dr. McDougall uh, in, in in his running of the MAPS trial um, for Stryker in doing this study, but this is evaluating large ver diameter versus small diameter coils. I asked a bunch of people at a CV section annual meeting, how many people think large diameter coils matter? We had no evidence to the fact. 80% of the people said yes. In fact, uh, a well-known neurodiversity by name of Alex Berenstein said, it makes sense. If you build a house with a stronger frame, it'll last longer. Uh, it's funny because that was the first time I've ever heard Alex speak, and he's now become a partner of mine, and we're close friends. It's one more rewarding aspect of this field. Um, but there was no evidence. And I'm not going to go through the details, but there's a bunch of papers. They suggest maybe there's some benefit, but none of them show it for sure. Um, and so without evidence... Uh, we're just going on anecdote. And we're just going on um, opinion. And Hippocrates uh, had a great quote, science is the father of knowledge, but opinion breeds ignorance. Uh, and I think that's certainly the potential here. And so we started this trial, trial prospective, randomized, um, blinded assessments, core lab adjudicated, 18 diameter versus non-18 coils. Uh, we targeted mid-size aneurysms. That's important to emphasize. 
If you look at the literature from the HELPS trial, they found that with small aneurysms, everything did pretty well. With large aneurysms, nothing did well. And it was the mid-sized aneurysms that probably is where you're going to detect a difference between different types of technology. And I can happily say last year, we completed enrollment, 651 patients uh, in the trial, which is pretty darn exciting. And we're undergoing the analysis now. We just pre presented the periprocedural uh, data at the Congress of Neurologic Surgeons this past uh, maybe three weeks ago. Uh, so that gave sort of a critical mass. Go up to Vandy, start running multiple trials. A whole bunch of trials we're now running and be a part of, IDE trials. Um, and as you develop that clinical expertise, you start doing these things, you get more ac academic opportunities, get to be involved in the SNIS. Uh, it's a real honor of my career to be president of that society, following the footsteps of Dr. Merduo. Um, to be involved in the CV section, to be involved with the American Heart and Stroke Association with the Joint Commission. These are really great things. But I'll tell you something else. If you're curious and you're pursuing these things, it doesn't only facilitate your research, but it improves the care you provide. So this is Mount Sinai. You can see we have hospitals scattered where we provide neurosurgical service all over New York City. And so in the context of trying to figure out how could we do the best research around things, we realized we really should consolidate our care protocols. We should have a new innovative process. So we bring certain diagnoses to certain hospitals so you're not spread out all over the place, right? Um, this is It's hard to do this unless you have this kind of a facility that's so broad, but we can bring all the intracerebral hemorrhages to one location, all the subarachnoid hemorrhages to, the, to another. We can consolidate our interventional spine program. We can consolidate functional neurosurgery. We create areas of expertise where we get the best treatment protocols. The nurses have lots of experience. Uh, so it, it helps us do research, but also helps us provide better care. Uh, when we've been publishing on this, the first thing I recommend is start with a what I'd call a curious review of the literature. Attack the literature in a way that you're going to challenge some you know, currently held misconceptions and figure out, is there value? So we were able to publish this paper, <clears throat> Dave Fiorell, Adam, Arthur, Mark Bain, and I really laying out the case that there was a role for us to continue to do research and figure out how to treat intracerebral hemorrhage, right? Early work had been done by the UCLA guys. Um, Dr. Martin really pioneered a lot of this uh, with some somewhat interesting results of doing an endoscope into an ICH to evacuate it, but it's really involved. Uh, we've published our technique called SCUBA, stereotactic ICH underwater blood aspiration. Um, and essentially what we do is we do it in an interventional suite. So we have uh, lots of imaging and you could do it in OR2. We like to do the interventional suite because we can do a Dyna CT. If you have intraoperative CT, that's fine as well. We use stereotactus to lo locate the clot, put a peel away sheath in. Oftentimes blood starts coming out right away. Uh, and then here's what it looks like after you've evacuated the blood. It's an extremely elegant procedure. It's very similar to um, you know many other uh, endoscopic cases. Um, you'll see, oh, it's going to, I must have done this. So I think it's when you do it with Zoom. I checked this so many times to make sure there wouldn't be a problem with the video. So I think we're stuck here for a second. Oh, we're going to have to see where this goes. Um, so here's another image where we uh, just put the suction in and the big giant Goomba clot just wants to come out. Uh, here's a picture with a bleeding blood vessel. And this is what we love about the endoscopic approach is you can easily see it. You can follow the blood back to where the bleeding is. And then you can take cautery and apply it and you can cauterize the blood vessel successfully, which we're able to do here in this video and stop the active bleeding. This has made us feel much more comfortable going early. Here's a case where the bleeding is coming out of the wall of the vessel. Uh, no, not, sorry, not the vessel, out of the wall, out of the white matter on the side. So you cauterize it right there. You can see the bleeding stops and then you can wash it out. We're able to get these really dramatic results with fantastic uh, evacuation rates uh, and really fantastic clinical outcomes. We've now published a number of papers. This is our first large series where we can show about a 90% evacuation rate. We can show extremely promising modified rank in zero to two and zero to three rates in follow-up. And I'll just give you a quick example. Obviously it's gonna be a case that went well. It's a gentleman 86 years old with this massive hemorrhage. And so uh, people felt, well, man, this looks this looks bad. This guy's a 97% chance of death. Um, he has a spot sign, which is a bad indicator. And essentially, he's going to have a bad outcome. 
But the reality is, is we're able to go in endoscopically, get the blood out, remove the large volume of clot. And this guy was able to have a really dramatic recovery. Here's him playing piano um, in rehab 30 days later. And by his 90 day follow up, he was no neurologic deficits with an MRS of one, uh, which was because he took more time to practice his new uh, pieces than he did before he had the hemorrhage. And so that early series stuff has led to a lot of work and trials going on. Uh, Mind, Invest, uh, Mirror is a trial we're doing with the Surgiscope and Rich just closed enrollment. Hopefully we'll find out early next time. Evacuate's a trial that we're working on with Bruce Campbell in Australia. Um, and Minute is a grant I'm working on right now. Um, by working together with a curious approach, it also strengthens your team. This is our cerebrovascular team. These are just the people that do cerebrovascular uh, here at Mount Sinai. I'm not going into the detail, but we have lots of trials, lots of grants, lots of publications, um, lots of funding. Um, and in fact, the practice itself grows, our clinical volume and our experience. Uh, uh, we were able to show reductions in treatment times as we develop the expertise across these places. So I want to emphasize this is doable, right? I just talked about all these different grants we have, ICH trials, a 651 prospective randomized trial for aneurysm coiling. But I want to emphasize that all of that didn't, I didn't start there. I started with getting a bunch of buddies together and reporting our first experience with a new technology and then doing some small prospective studies and then doing larger prospective single arm studies and then doing small randomized studies and then doing large randomized trials. So it's one step at a time. You'll get to a place that you didn't even know you could get to. And the other thing it's going to do is it's going to lead to opportunity if you approach things with this curious way. Since I was getting better at answering questions and designing trials, uh, medical device startups started asking me questions of how to help them. This is something a lot of people find really interesting. And frankly, it's been very fun. If you can help bring a technology to, to patients into the clinic, you're going to influence and touch so many more lives than you can with your own two hands, or even that your trainees can, that you train. So early on, I worked with a company called Enfocus and Lazarus Effect, and that led to a relationship with a company called Reverse Medical and uh, Pulsar Vascular Medina. And... Um, a company called Blockade that started. And obviously I did a lot of work running the pivotal trials for aspiration thrombectomy with penumbra. And over about a four-year time period, these companies all achieved successful exits. They were either bought by large strategics or in penumbra's case did a successful IPO. And so uh, getting that experience, just kind of fumbling through that, uh, I learned a lot about how that world works. And that created a momentum that brought a whole bunch of new companies sort of to me to ask for my assistance and guidance. It's been really fun. Um, 2019 and 20, we had a number of other companies go. Uh, 2021, another one. And now it's evolved to whole different spaces, not just like simple devices, but artificial intelligence, uh, spine technologies, brain computer interface, all kinds of interesting new things. But it doesn't come at zero cost. Curiosity is hard. It takes time and energy to think differently. So I want to emphasize that, right? It's easier to be judgmental. It's easier to default to not challenging the way you think. I'm going to give you a little tiny example, which is the current American Heart and Stroke Association guidelines. They have a, a recommendation. Patients should receive mechanical thrombectomy with a stent retriever if they meet all the following criteria. Well, first, I'm going to take issue with that whole stent retriever thing. It's silly because we've already shown this is a paper that uh, for a trial that I was able to run um, and publish in Lancet in 2019, that uh, outcomes were clearly statistically not inferior with secondary outcomes potentially suggesting that it's cheaper and faster uh, to use aspiration as your first line approach. So with that data, plus the ASTRA trial from Europe, it's very hard uh, for me to understand why they continue to keep the caveat of with a stent retriever in there. They added a later recommendation that says aspiration um, is not inferior, but it's it's weird <laughs> the way you were so anchored to a particular device. Personally, I would just say we should perform thrombectomy. But what's also interesting is we have these strong limitations, pre-stroke MRS of zero to one. This is a huge question. The non-curious thing to do would be to just say, okay, if anyone has any disability at all, they're not going to get a thrombectomy. I'm not going to offer it. But it turns out we've worked on some single uh, center and some multi-center observational data, which suggests that patients with baseline disability still benefit. Over a quarter of them get back to their pre-stroke baseline. Do we not offer this therapy? Now, what is interesting is their mortality is higher 
you know, there's, they're, they're fragile. And so there is a higher mortality in patients with baseline disability. But what's our goal? To try to save people's lives and get them back to a quality of life or to worry about what our metrics look like? It's, it's a very reasonable discussion to have. Um, so we're staying curious on this. We're fighting to figure this out. That I actually just two days ago found out we got funding from uh, PCORI for TESTED, which is going to be a trial specifically to evaluate thrombectomy for patients with baseline disability. But there's all these other things, like if it's a distal occlusion, an M2 or M3 type occlusion, if the patient has a, a low NIH stroke scale or a high aspect score, should these patients be excluded? Um, I would say no. So, you know, personally, I've put in a great many hours, I don't even know how many, about three hours a week for the last uh, year, basically, um, working on STEP, the stroke net thrombectomy on the vascular platform, which is specifically to look at all these indication expansion spaces. Uh, we have noticed that it is NIH funded uh, through the, what's called the OTA mechanism. Um, and hopefully in the next nine months, that's going to be rolling out to centers uh, to start expanding the boundaries, right? But it takes work. You got to put the effort in. You got to stay passionate about it. But how far can this take us, right? If you're willing to put in the work, how far can curiosity take you? And I would challenge you and everyone that it's going to take us really far. We have to stop thinking small. And as an example, think about cardiology and and the procedures for cardiology, right? For a long time, we just had cabbages, uh, then, then sort of transplants. And then interventional came along. But for a long time, up until about 2000, 2001, really everything was just, can you put in a balloon uh, uh, and a stent? Um, balloons first, then, then balloons and stents. Uh, and, and it was a pretty limited space. But since that time, around 2002, 2003, the space has exploded. There's valve repair, there's septal defects, there's watchman devices, there's structural heart, there's electrophysiology, there's ablation catheters and rewiring the heart. Why can't we do these things in the brain? I'll tell you that I think we're already starting. Uh, Carl Hyman, an awesome, amazing human being and a fantastic chairman uh, at Tufts uh, with his partner and neurodimensionalist Adam Malik, they've been pioneering the e-shunt. Instead of doing a traditional shunt to treat CSF drainage for the brain, they're going transvascular and putting a shunt in from the CSF space down to the jugular. Uh, pretty amazing if it works. They've done a few cases in, in South America, and they're just starting an IDE here in the United States. The first case was performed in, at Yale just recently. Or Pierre Graban, who talk about a guy who's curious, invented the Mercy stent retrie the Mercy clot retriever, uh, the very first thrombectomy device, then also revolutionized retinoblastoma treatment with intraarterial op uh, ophthalmic artery chemo. Uh, he's working on the river stent trial, structural heart, let's repair the sinuses to treat IIH, really incredible stuff. But what about electrophysiology of the brain from a transvascular approach. Well, that's happening too. This is uh, one of my conflicts. I'm involved in an investor with a company called Synchron where we're doing transvascular brain computer interface, putting a stent electrode array in the sagittal sinus to read uh, the electrocorticography of the motor and premotor cortex and transition the thought of movement into a digital signal to interact with the outside world. So it doesn't matter if you have a spinal cord injury or if you have a brainstem infarct or if you have ALS or if you have a limb amputation, if you can't use your limbs, uh, this will take the signal from your brain and directly go to your computer. Here's uh, just some great videos. Um, it shows us we use stereotactic localization to identify the motor cortex and place it. Here's the very first device being uh, unsheathed in the brain with a 3D. This was done in uh, Melbourne, Australia uh, a few years ago. And this is the very first patient. This is that gentleman. You see, there's no big wires. There's nothing coming out of his head. And he's able to use this device. Uh, and in this case, he's using it with eye tracking to open a Word document and start typing a message. Uh, and he's just using a regular off-the-shelf laptop. The device uses Bluetooth to send out the signal. Here's another gentleman who's using it to type. Uh, he's using it in context with eye tracking. But uh, if you know the space, people with eye tracking really don't, they struggle with typing because you have to linger on a word for two seconds or so for a clock to click that you really mean it. Uh, being able to mentally click the button is a huge advantage. And I love this one. This is a gentleman, the first gentleman. 
she just propped this computer up on a bunch of books. They're just sitting at home. But by being able to use WhatsApp, this completely changed his life because his wife, he's very hypophonic from ALS. His wife felt she couldn't really leave the room uh, because she couldn't hear him if he needed her. Now with the technology, he can use the WhatsApp to message her. She felt she was free not just to leave the room, but to go to the grocery store, or run errands or anything else. Really, really life transforming for this gentleman. Uh, we were able to get FDA approval for a trial um, last year. We were able to get NIH funding uh, near the end of last year. We just enrolled our first patient earlier this year, and uh, we did our second one about a month ago, and the third patient set to be enrolled uh, next month at UPMC, actually the first U.S. case outside of Mount Sinai. So I would just challenge you that if you're curious about questions about the space, about thinking differently, our future is going to be much bigger than our past. And that should be exciting. We should be curious about that future. Uh, and But it's not just about how much can we achieve or what can we do, but how rich is our life while we're doing it. Um, and I got to say, it's it's made my life very rich. This is a holiday party of my research lab uh, right before COVID, <laughs> which is fun. Uh, traveling with the SNIS, uh, a lot of uh, colleagues of Dr. McDougall's and I through the SNIS organization, Blaze Baxter, Philippe Albuquerque, and everyone else, uh, lobbying uh, for politicians to get better stroke coverage, engaging with the next generation of upcoming leaders, uh, getting to spend time with your mentors who have helped you, here's Sander and his son, um, and just having fun. These are our, my partners from the cerebrovascular team at Alex's 70th birthday party. Uh, Alex Berenstein having a great time. And this would be poor, performing complex surgery on Anand Siddiqui, a prior speaker uh, that you guys had for this uh, uh, session, uh, removing a splinter that he got while we were vacationing together down in Florida uh, with our families. So you have this amazing life, you get to do great things, but it's more than just great time with your friends, right? There's this uh, Jean-Baptiste André Dumas was a um, famous um, individual in Napoleonic France. Um, and he was a, a very famous scientist who ended up running uh, large segments of the government. And near the end of his life, he said, I've seen many phases of my life. I've moved in imperial circles. Uh, he was a friend of Napoleon's. I've been a minister of state. He's He's done all kinds of things. But if I had to live my life over again, I'd remain in my laboratory for the greatest joy of my life has been accomplished original scientific work. And next to that, to lecture intelligent students. Um, and so I would just say that that's pretty great advice. And I think it's something we could all do to remember or learn from. Um, so at the end, the lesson of sort of this path that I've tread and what I would encourage to all of you is every day in life, we're presented with an opportunity to learn. And when those opportunities come up every time, we have a choice to be judgmental or to be curious. And I would recommend to listen to Ted Lasso, be curious. Uh, I think your life will be a lot richer for it. And with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mogo. It was a tremendous talk, certainly eye-opening and inspiring. Uh, we'll start with a few questions from, from us. The first one is really important for us. How do you how do you choose a mentor? What is your vision on how to choose a mentor or, or the mentor chooses you? How is that process? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, the truth is there's a million ways to, 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 to get a mentor, right? Um, I've seen it every single way. Uh, when I was doing that translational science research, I actually cold called people to see who would be willing to mentor me um, in terms of, I, I, I got a fantastic mentor in, in complement physiology and science by the name of John Lambert at, at, uh, at uh, UPenn. And I literally just called him up and said, look, you've been doing this work. We're doing work similar. I'd like to work with you. And that led to some great experiences. He ran a compliment meeting out in, in Rhodes, Greece, which was phenomenal to go to. So sometimes you have to be a little proactive and reach out. Sometimes life puts it in front of you, but you got to keep your eyes open and see. But I will tell you this, um, don't ever feel locked in. Stay flexible. Engage with as many people as you can uh, and, and what's going to happen is there's going to be a natural momentum. And when you feel that momentum, when you feel like it jives and it clicks, uh, it's going to be really spectacular. Uh, I, I look, if I wasn't at Columbia university, Sander wouldn't have been my mentor. Um, 
And uh, I'm very lucky for that because that that certainly influenced my life a great deal. So these are the kind of things you you look towards. You put yourself in a position to connect with as many people as you can. Great, awesome, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Moko, uh, I'm Leonardo Brazilian, one of the fellows here too. Uh, just have a question for you, real quick. Um, uh, your talk made me think of uh, some of the uh, inspirational moments that I've seen, you know, in other sports like basketball with Michael Jordan saying, you know, everyone remembers the winning shots, but they don't know how many thousands of shots missed and things like that. And now uh, you're presenting all your successes and this tremendous amount of research to be able to accomplish. Um, but I was wondering uh, if you could share with us some of the um, like opportunities that you've learned through the process by not actually succeeding and uh, the uh, applications for grants that didn't go that didn't go through or didn't win and because uh, i've had some of those too in my early uh, years as a resident where i applied for grants and didn't get them and then you kind of get discouraged you know like how can you change and make it better and kind of don't, don't feel like repeating the work again right so yeah that's a great point uh, i think that there's two answers uh so the first one is when Michael Jordan was in middle school, I'm sure he missed a great number of shots. Way, you know, his, his percentage for the field was a lot lower. And high school got better and college got better, right? So the point is, is that you have to be tenacious and continue to work to improve. And eventually, that's the message. It's not that, I, I don't think, that when he was already in the zenith of his career uh, at the apex it, as, a, as a Chicago Bull, that he was missing like crazy. It's also that he spent the time to miss to get better. And the same thing exists in everything in life, including research. When I started doing research as a medical student, I probably was successful on 10% of the projects I worked on. And then by the time I was a resident, I was probably suggest successful on a 30 or 40%. And then, you know, so forth and so on. So now I have a good feeling, a good sense. Uh, I've developed experience where I know what's probably going to be reasonable and what isn't. It doesn't mean I don't fail still, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, to the tenacity you need. But now, uh, you know, I've got a, a batting average that's closer to 800 than 200. Um, and that's from experience and continually not being afraid to fail and stop. But it still happens, and you can still have that. And so that gets back to the tenacity I mentioned, right? Tenacity of continuing no matter what. I just had, I had a grant that I put in that I was really pumped about. And it got a phenomenal score on its first submission. Um, not quite, it was right on the border of funding, but for a first submission, we were really psyched. And they came back and they said, this is great, this is wonderful. You know, tweak it a little bit, it looks fantastic. So we said, okay, no problem. Everything takes two, two submissions, no worries. Tweaked it, sent it in, super pumped, came back with a much worse score. <laughs> and, and, and it was heartbreaking. I mean, really devastating. So first I went through about a month of just hating everybody in the world and thinking life isn't fair. And then I worked through it. Well, it wasn't really a month. It was a few days. Worked through that. And, and now I'm working on, on not stopping, not giving up, continuing to put it in, continuing to submit. Uh, and so I think that's there has to be a level of tenacity, but with flexibility to, if something's truly not working, shift towards the things that you're getting traction with so that you continue to be productive. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Moko, another question is, how do you find your balance between clinical activity and research? Because sometimes, you know, the more research you do, like you showed, it's like overwhelming and opportunities begin to present and it's like a roller coaster. So, and you also need to get better in the clinical aspect. Well, so I, I'm a very clinically oriented person. And so what I was trying to get at about saying that research helps your clinical practice and vice versa. Um, you know, I went to University of Florida because there was a significant need for someone. You know, Brian was there, um, Steve Lewis was there, but it was a very, very busy place. And I knew I'd be busy right away. So I get a lot of clinical experience. Um, and then likewise with Vanderbilt. Uh, and now here we're, we're an extremely busy clinical program here at Mount Sinai. Uh, I think that I'm busier clinically because of my research because of the reputation I have, because I, you know, not infrequently get patients sent to me from really people I respect and think the world of who are cerebrovascular physicians who are sending me the patient because I have access to some device or tool that they don't have access to. 
um, and they 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 think I could help and use it. So there is a synergy there, and I think you want to find that synergy. If your research and your clinical practice have nothing to do with each other, it's look for a long time in my career. I still did brain tumors. I still loved. I still love doing. Them. They're fun. They're great cases. But at a certain point, if I'm doing a brain tumor, there's no synergy with the rest of my practice. And so it doesn't make sense. So I don't really do them anymore. Uh, I just focus on the vascular stuff. So I I don't think that you have to sacrifice your clinical experience. I mean, I've done 400 plus cases a year and for most of my career, much more than that. Um, I'm, I'm getting slower in my old age uh, for my whole career. And uh, I don't think that has to that has to stop. Um, the only other thing I'd say about that is you, you have to figure out where your priorities lie. My, I don't have a good golf game and I don't fly my own planes and I don't do a lot of things that a lot of my good friends do, uh, because this is my passion and my hobby. So I'm clinically busy. I spend a lot of time with my kids and I do this. Um, and as a result, you know, you do not want me in your foursome on the on the links <laughs> okay dr moko uh, we don't have any more questions it was a really good session inspiring for us as young fellows so thank you very much for everything and i hope you we can have you again at some point absolutely it was a real honor and i appreciate it guys thank you very much That's terrific it was terrific i really appreciate it and really um really i think great points for people starting out their career and about how to do it the incremental steps you took is really great. Uh, appreciate a lot. Thanks for coming. No problem.